Yes, it's time to get real. Hi, this is Dennis of the Bartender. You know me. <laughs> Pastor Jay has asked me to invite you all to join us to get real here at the Ecclesia Cafe Piano Bar. And uh, here is Pastor Jay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's always good to hear. We're almost to the end of this, but I want to introduce you to our bartender, Angel. Hey, everybody. Hi. All right, Angel. God bless Praise you. Praise God. I'm glad you, you've been with me almost all the way through this series. Yeah. And I don't know what I would have done without you. Yeah. I guess we should just get going here, huh? Yeah. All right. And here we are. We are in number 110. 110 in our series and uh, this one is called crucifixion and burial how much further can we go in these gospels right subtitle of jesus christ we're sure going to be doing this one a lot different folks we're going to have more of a commentary this time <laughs> so let me uh, start this little teaching off here and uh, what I mean by that is we're not going to be having so much reading. I always have all these scriptures to, on here, right? But well, we're at a point now where we just got to tell the story. And there's just too many scriptures to get crucifixion and burial all in one teaching. So you're going to have to do it. It is sometime after noon of Thursday, the whole Tuesday. We went on Tuesday for weeks and weeks and weeks. <laughs> and then we finally got to Wednesday. And then Wednesday now became Thursday. At this point, we, we had the trial. This, this all happened prior to noon of Thursday. So here we are after the trial and everything, noon Thursday. When the procession reaches the outskirts of Jerusalem and the crowd gathers on a craggy little hill which is known as Golgotha. So you see they've already come down this hill. All, all those scriptures in here that we should be reading, could be reading, is it describing this. As Jesus is nailed to the wooden cross and lifted up, the scene below him becomes a strange mixture of emotions. On one hand he sees the bitter sorrow of his family. And on the other hand, he sees the, uh, the carnival. It's a regular carnival going on down there, like atmosphere of the soldiers and those who have demanded his death. It's a big celebration going on. They always like to see a crucifixion, I guess, but particularly this one. As he awaits his death on the cross there, with increasing pain and agony, you can imagine. It's all in the scriptures I want you to read. Jesus speaks briefly with one of the two robbers crucified with him. Remember, there are three crosses. And he speaks to the one crucified with him there. Then seeing his mother, Mary, he directs John to care for her. Now we see this said in all so many different ways. But it's basically that John should care for her. Remember, in reality, John is just a young boy. He's only, what, 14 or 15 years old. He wants her, her, him to care for Mary. Of course, back in those days, 14 and 15, you were almost a grown man. By early afternoon, the end is near. The early afternoon, right in the middle of Thursday, as unusual darkness covers the land, as prophesied, Jesus cries out his last words and gives up his spirit in death. The significance of the hour is marked by a series of miraculous events which fill the people with awe. We have finally come to the time of the crucifixion and burial of Jesus Christ. The most wonderful time of all time is right here, the crucifixion and the burial of Jesus Christ. Because this is the big step God is making between what we can read in all of the Bible and where God is going in his kingdom and his eternity. This is the uh, bridge here. 
we uh, get real belief by what we have been reading in the scripture up until now that this all took place on our Thursday. And I've just been repeating it, repeating it. We just believe this has all t been taking place on Thursday. Crucifixion and burial and his death. Not on the Friday which is celebrated so sincerely by sweet, wonderful Christians <laughs> each year as a traditional Good Friday. Oh, they make it such a holy day. And if the scriptures are correct that we've been studying, I'm wondering what God thinks. I guess he's blessed, but maybe he's thinking, why can't you get it right? Why can't you get anything right? I've given you a brain, I've given you eyes, I've given you intelligence and wisdom. Why can't you figure this out? This little thing, if you can't figure this little thing out, how will you be able to accept the bigger things? Now, I'm just saying all of that, but... The Good Friday, which brings into question if we could hold on to a celebration date like this when we know better, and we do know better, most pastors that I've talked to do, could we also be holding on to beliefs without true facts to support them? All of the things, all of the, con the condemnations that we, we dig up against one another as Christians, or as people in the world, do we join in with the rest of the organized religions, I'm saying that plural, from generation to generation to celebrate this false Good Friday tradition. Would do we do that? Do we celebrate that now that we know? Do we celebrate it? Answer? Yes, we do. With a cheerful heart, <laughs> but in love, with the knowledge of the truth in our hearts. What is truth? Truth. That's what that's what uh, Pilate said. What is truth? <laughs> well, let me tell you, Pilate. Truth being that Jesus died for our salvation to usher in a new covenant to justify all who believe an eternity with Father. To begin with the church age we are now experiencing that we shall share with our brothers and sisters in one spirit, what the Bible said we read, we'll all be in one spirit, we'll be as one as they are one. In preparation for the kingdom God has established in which we will serve him for an eternity. It means no end. God is Alpha Omega. This is how we're going to be, the Alpha Omega. <laughs> It'll be the Omega. The, there's no end. It just goes around and around. That's what we get, a, a, a ring for a wedding a band because there's no beginning and no end in a, in a wedding band an inheritance we shall enjoy as the children of God forever the crucifixion and burial cover so many scriptures as I said we are going to hand them over to you <laughs> they're all going <laughs> to hand them over to you guys I'm handing them over to you angel you got a lot of homework <laughs> Bring it on. For you to study in your own quality time with Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will guide you and teach you. You'll see things that you had never heard in church. This series is so far, this series so far has been 109 or 110 sessions of scriptures to share with you as I would read them. Especially lately in this very busy last week of the ministry of Jesus Christ. But this part is something you should already know. You've heard it enough, and you should know it in your heart, and should read and reread so that you can truly appreciate what Christ did for us. And just have it on the tip of your tongue and the tip of your heart that this is all you would think about. Don't get so messed up in the computer and all the things of this life and making the money and all of that. There's so much distraction around us. We need to know the truth. We need to know where we're going here. People, a young man has visions and an older man has dreams. God showed me to how to interpret that for me. That a young man has visions because He's, so, he's groping, he's trying to find a way for his life. He wants to know, where will I work? Where should I go to school? Who should I marry? What am I going to do with this and that? Oh, who am I going to 
elect so that down the road the government will be better than it is today. He has so many things on his mind, but they're all visions of how can I be a part of them? But they're young, and this is what God would say that they would have visions. How about the old man? The old man has dreams. The old man has been through all that. The old man thinks ahead. When he's brave enough, he can think ahead and start reading the scriptures and start seeing what's ahead, what's in eternity, what's going to be there waiting for him, and what is he going to be doing for an eternity. There's so many things to look at there. So you dream about it. There are dreams of the hope that God has promised us that is laying out there. So here I am, an old man dreaming. <laughs> but I hope that the young people can pick up a little something here and there for their visions that they are building here for their lives because eventually you'll be like me you'll be able to gather all that up and use them for the eternity that you're going to spend with god here are the scriptures as each apostle wrote them down about the crucifixion and burial of jesus now i'm going to give them to you right now so make note from here on i'll just leave them on the screen Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all have scriptures here. Okay? Here's the first one. Matthew 27, 39 through 66. Matthew 27, 39 through 66. And then Mark 15, 23 through 46. And then Luke 23... 32 through 56, and then John 19, 19 through 42. Read all those. Digest and memorize them if you can. <laughs> you got all those, angel? Yep, I got them. I think it's an angel here already knows. But the Bible says that angels like to look into these things that we study. <laughs> if you're really an angel, but... I didn't know they made bartenders out of angels, but... You never know. The Bible also says, be careful who you're entertaining. They might be an angel, and so maybe... <laughs> be nice. Okay, write those down and study them. Got them. The commentary by F. Lagarde Smith seems to summarize this time schedule in a way I can truly be in one accord with, as you've noticed. And although we do not recommend taking commentary as a gospel, don't do that. Don't take somebody else's ideas of what the Bible says. Don't do that. That's how we get into trouble. We have the Holy Spirit to teach us, not some dodo that's got an, is a sinner himself. I don't care what, how many robes he wears. And although we do not recommend taking this commentary as gospel, we will at this time, awful J, we will at this time use F. Lagarde Smith's published commentary along with his daily Bible chronologi in chronological order of the four gospels because these are from which we have drawn most of this chronological study and this series, all 110, maybe uh, it's going to be 111 or 12 before we're through. Let's start with a bit of a review showing how we got to this place on Thursday late afternoon because this is a key, key thing here right now. When Jesus gave up his spirit and death after this, the week leading up to there, he taught and taught and taught. He taught everything in this last week that 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 he could he wanted to have right there at the very end for his disciples. Yes indeed. <clears throat> <laughs> you really like that stuff. Some of that good bristlecone blend. Yeah, I got a whole new fresh pot of coffee. Coffee, bro. thank you. I gonna do a frappe sometime. <laughs> Never mind. Okay. Yeah, God provides a large menu here. Going back to the Last Supper. Now, it's not going back very far. That would be what we think is Wednesday. Traditionally, the Last Supper is believed to have occurred on Thursday evening. That's what everybody believes. Followed by the crucifixion on Friday afternoon. I hope we've shown that you can't do it on Friday. Friday is a special Sabbath. 
However, this raises at least two important questions. First, a whole day just disappears or is totally inactive at a time when Jesus appears to have a complete action-packed filled last week of his life. Second, and far more important really, if Jesus is crucified on Friday afternoon and therefore hurriedly put into the tomb, even if that were so, how can there be sufficient time to match Jesus' own prediction that he would remain in the tomb for three days and three nights before being resurrected? Even if one stretches imagination within the traditional time frame here in order to find parts of three days, it is not possible to find three nights. So from Jesus' own words, it's impossible to fit all of this in to make it Friday, a good Friday. The resolution of both questions appears to be found in recognition that the Last Supper took place on Wednesday evening, like we have been showing you, followed by the arrest Wednesday evening and trial during Wednesday night. That's when they went out to the Garden of Gethsemane and he was kissed by Judas and arrested, being completed at daybreak Thursday morning with crucifixion and burial on Thursday just like the chronological scriptures have told us in our study. We must have an understanding of the Passover feast of unleavened bread, plus the way G the Jews figured time. Their day starts at sunset, remember? Passover is, uh, is observed on the 14th day of the month of Nisan, corresponding to March, April on our calendar. As we have taught on several occasions, Passover is observed of the deliverance of the ancient Israelites from their Egyptian bondage. And Passover is followed by the seven-day Feast of Unleavened Bread right after that. This representing all that the escaping Israelites had to eat during their travel out of Egypt. It was all unleavened bread. From what I hear, if you also look at Leviticus 23, we'll stick that in there, Leviticus 23, you will see by God's direction, God's direction and those laws of the Old Testament, that a lamb, a lamb is to be slaughtered late on the 14th day, which is Passover. And the Passover meal would be eaten that evening which would be the beginning of the 15th day, the beginning of the seven days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Seven days they celebrate. The entire 15th day is then to be observed as a special Sabbath or holy day, regardless of the day of the week on which it might fall. For instance, if it were Friday, then both Friday and the ongoing regular weekly Sabbath of Saturday were both observed as Sabbaths. That, not, not much to be done. With this as a background, maybe the picture begins to come a little more clear. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three, recorded the disciples' pre preparation for the Passover. This was on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, on which day the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed late, late in the day on the 14th. That would place their preparations at the beginning of the Jewish 14th day, which of course begins on the evening of our 13th day. Wow. Did I get you, <laughs> Angel? <laughs> the evening of our 13th day. Remember when it becomes evening of, on our 13th day, the Jews now are on their 14th day. Okay. It appears that the disciples assume that they are preparing the upper room primarily for the special paschal meal, which they expect to share with Jesus the following evening. And apparently do not co contemplate that the regular meal on the first will be in fact 
their last supper, their last supper with Jesus. And they'd all be very famous for the paintings. Jesus was the sacrificial lamb being prepared to be sacrificed for all the sins of the world. Behind the scenes, who's Jesus being prepared for a sacrifice as a sacrificial lamb for all the sins of the United States? No, all the sins of the whole world, the Bible says. John says it, John the Baptist. I have, Jesus tells us, I have eagerly, he's talking to his disciples now as they sit down for this meal, I have eagerly desi desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. He's calling it that. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. He's referring to the suffering he is anticipating that his own sacrificial death would take place later that day, the 14th, which would prevent him from participating in the actual Passover meal. John's Gospel eliminates any doubt that this supper occurred prior to the actual Passover meal. When Jesus tells Judas to, go, to do what he's about to do, you've read, we read that, we read that some of the disciples thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the feast, that there might be more stuff that they needed for the Passover meal. We also read last time that the Jews would not enter, the Jews out there would not enter the palace at this time for fear that they would be ceremonially unclean and therefore unable to eat the Passover. So they were all aware of the time. And we read that Jesus was already with them for this trial. Most convincing is that the day of Jesus' crucifixion is plainly stated to also be the day of preparation of the Passover meal. He was prepared and then killed, just like the lamb that they were going to have for the meal. This time it was Jesus being prepared the day on which the lamb is slain for the Passover meal, taken during the evening of that day. Maybe this is included in our communion that we do. Every church has communion. Our non-denominational non church, we would do it at least once a, a month, and, and any other time that we would want, but some religions do it all the time. But with us, Maybe it has something to do with that when Jesus tells us that the bread is his body. It's his body. And the wine or the juice is his blood. That we should eat and drink of it in remembrance of him until he returns. Well, when there's little children in the congregation, they freak out over this a little bit. <laughs> and I see the parents trying to explain it to them. The most meaningful result of moving away from the traditional time frame we are used to, probably talking about Good Friday here, is seeing how the crucifixion of Jesus becomes the perfect type of the Passover lamb. Under Hebrew law, the lamb is chosen on the 10th day, the 10th day, and then kept up and taken care of until the 14th day when it begins to be uh, prepared, when it is sacrificed for sins of the people. If Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem is counted as the 10th day, then Thursday would be the 14th day, the day when Jesus is crucified. So maybe it goes all, his preparation goes all the way back to the 10th. Far more important than this parable is the fact that Jesus, as the perfect Lamb of God, does not celebrate the Passover with some other ordinary sacrificial lamb, but rather becomes himself the Lamb who was slain precisely at the proper hour. There is therefore strong evidence that the Last Supper takes place on the evening prior to the day of preparation, which in modern reckoning for you and me would be Wednesday night. So I'm going to leave you to read all those scriptures I gave you. We'll see you next time. Now I live in all your pride.
promises And nothing seems worthwhile Except to be In your kingdom of love My Lord 